Hey guys, welcome to the What I Love About Men podcast. My name is Steph Ganowski, and as a men's coach, I'm on a mission to help men prioritize themselves, take ownership over their challenges, set boundaries in their relationships, and much more, all while adding a female touch and perspective. I hope this podcast helps you. We need you men, and as a woman, I'm rooting for you. Enjoy. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode. I am going to take your biggest sex-related challenges and give a little perspective around them because I recently posted a, uh, in my stories on Instagram the other day, it was yesterday, of just asking what are your biggest sex-related challenges right now and I had a, a ton of responses so I combined them into 13, um, 13 main topics Some of them were repeated. So overall, 13 different scenarios in which you guys feel challenged, which is really interesting and I'm sure can be really helpful for you guys to listen in because even for those of you who didn't feel brave enough to share or um, were comfortable, shouldn't just say brave, like comfortable, um, it's it's a personal thing, right? So first of all, I, I respect everybody who trusted me to share all this. Um, or to share your personal challenge with me, but it's a good thing you did because now I'm, I'm talking about it. Of course, I will leave all identities out. <laughs> so let's go into this. And before I go into this, guys, if you haven't noticed in my, in my social media, if you follow me, I have just come back from a while being away from Instagram. And what I did in the time when I was away was actually... I actually decided to rebrand. I decided to focus more on sex-related topics and communication and behavior. Um, And eventually what I want to do is to be a sex coach for couples. So that was actually always my game plan, which is kind of funny because I look at old videos of myself and old goals, and it was always start working with men. Once I'm comfortable with men, start bringing women into the mix and actually working with couples and giving perspective to each of them and working through their issues with them in terms of behavior and actually more along the lines of sex. So when I think about this, I'm right on track with what I've always wanted to do in my life, which is kind of cool. So so whatever perspectives I give you now, understand that I'm about to go to school for sex, for sexology to become a certified sex coach and sexologist. And at this point, no, I am not certified. I am not a I am not a, uh, I don't have a master's in human sexuality either. What I do have is an, a self made education that I have been feeding for years and years, probably seven years now. I'm obsessed with learning, I'm obsessed with working with other people, and I've been in the coaching industry working through these scenarios for five plus years now. So, um, in the relationship space, oh, almost four years. So when it comes to these issues, these are things I've helped my clients with, regardless of me being a sex expert or um, having formal sex, sex education, but I am going into it in the future. So I will have more of that, that current research involved to really give you guys tools and techniques and tactics and whatnot. But for right now, I think I have a pretty good perspective on what's worked for clients in the past based on these challenges. So just take... You know, just take what I have to say as another perspective, another female perspective to help guide you and help give you more direction and more clarity around these situations. And, you know, even just having conversations with with friends and people who question certain scenarios just helps you gain more clarity around them. So just think of me as helping you getting clearer clearer, um, and more confident in these areas that I'm about to discuss. All right. That was my my little uh, disclaimer. All right. Let's go into these 13 biggest sex-related challenges that I got in terms of responses from my Instagram. And obviously, I could go on and on with these 13 things. I'm going to try to keep it to like two to three minutes each. So just kind of give a quick recap, quick perspective around each one. I can't deep dive, but I wanted to touch on all of your comments um, just so that you all feel heard. All right, so number one, oral sex when no real connection is built and also feeling like sex is incomplete without oral sex. All right, so this is pretty interesting. I would say that if you're feeling challenged by the fact that you can't either relax during oral sex or you don't feel comfortable 
um, performing oral sex on the partner you're with, I would ask yourself why you're doing it. If it doesn't feel right or if it feels like a challenge or if you don't feel ready, um, most likely your body's not ready. Your mind isn't ready for it. Um, But I would ask yourself why, you know, like, why does this feel like a challenge for me? It's always good to ask ourselves questions when we're put in scenarios that make us do a double take or think twice about it. Something is not right. Something is off. And when something's off, we want to clarify what's off by questioning ourselves. It may sound silly to question yourself, but when you do that, It is giving yourself another viewpoint um, and and forcing yourself to come up with an answer you normally wouldn't come up with, right? So when it comes to, and this, this kind of, it feels like you're forcing, or you might be forcing oral sex into the mix of your sexual experience because you feel like sex is incomplete without oral sex, you know, going along with your second point. So if you're feeling like sex is not complete without oral and then you feel challenged performing oral sex or accepting oral sex without a real connection, then that's really going to, that's really going to um, confuse your sex life overall. I would say it's going to make you less vulnerable, less open, um, less expansive when it comes to your sexual interactions. And it will more likely put a block on you if you don't understand why um, oral sex is a challenge. So I would get really clear on that. You know, I would ask yourself, why is it, why does it feel like a challenge? You know, when do I, when do I feel ready for it? What needs to happen for me to feel like it's not a challenge? And how can I put a boundary around it until I feel like it feels good and it feels right? And also understanding that oral sex does not complete a sexual experience. You know, you can have even outer course is sex. It's a type of sex, right? So when we have, um, you know, a sexual experience is not only penetration. A sexual experience can be laying naked together, like rubbing against each other. A sexual experience can be playing with toys or masturbating next to each other. It doesn't necessarily have to be penetration along with oral sex, which is how the porn industry and the media portrays it to be right? So you can have a sexual, deep, intimate sexual experience with someone that is fully complete and fulfilling for each other, for both people. And there's no orga- there's no orgasm, there's no penetration, there's no oral sex, but you can still feel fulfilled. So I think we need to understand that there are different types of sex and different ways of feeling sexually fulfilled. So going back to your original concern or challenge, I would ask yourself why it's a challenge, what would have to happen for it to not feel like a challenge, and what can you do to, if, if needed, create a boundary around how you can feel good about a sexual experience moving forward without oral or with it. All right, number two. Getting more sex to begin with. Okay, so this is a sex-related challenge for people. Um, I don't mean to laugh, but I had a lot of people with this response and they were laughing with it. So I'm just thinking of people's reactions as they wrote this. So when it comes to getting more sex to begin with, I would, I would ask yourself, you know, are you putting yourself in the place to accept a sexual relationship at this point in your life? Sometimes when, for the single person, sometimes it's a matter of just being a hermit and not putting yourself out there. Sometimes it's a matter of blocking yourself when you do meet someone and just kind of sexually closing down, shutting off because you're insecure, because it's been a really long time, and because you have this somewhat of an insecurity around opening up sexually again or becoming sexually vulnerable, you actually shut yourself out to the possibilities of allowing sex to happen in your life. But it does take putting yourself out there, right? It does take to embrace your own sex life with yourself. And when you feel really comfortable sexually with yourself, it's easier to express your sexual self with other people. And it comes across more genuine in the fact that you are a sexual human and you express that and you're comfortable with that and you want to share that part of yourself. So I would ask yourself, if you're in this situation and you're single, um, how comfortable are you with your sexual relationship with yourself? And how often do you have sexual experiences alone? 
And if so, what is preventing you from doing that? And if you did that, do you feel you would be more comfortable sexually expressing yourself with other people in order to initiate more sexual experiences? As far as someone who's in a relationship, if you were to respond with getting more sex to begin with, I would, I would ask yourself, when was the last time you did have an active sex life with your partner? What was different at that time? What were you doing? What were you not doing? Asking these questions can help you get into the, the space of reliving that event and going back to those memories of, you know what? I was actually a different type of person when I was having sex with, sex with my partner. You know, I didn't, I set a lot more boundaries. I had a lot more fun. I, um, you know, I, I flirted a lot more with my partner. I accepted flirtation from my partner more. So it was just easy for sex to be initiated. So think back to when I think that's, that's probably one of the best things that help that would help a couple, um, just based on my perspective and research and what I've learned working with people is understand when I was getting it and it was active at one point, which drew me to this person most likely, you know, your most active sex life was in the beginning of your relationship, what was different? And how can you bring some of those little things back? Not in a way where it's obnoxious and you bring them all back because that's not going to feel genuine, but we do have to bring back the flirtation into relationships that tend to, that tend to grow old together and, and we forget how to flirt and date each other, right? When we're at that point. Um, I see, I say we are meaning humans in general. All right, let's go to number three. Number three of the biggest sex-related challenge is my head getting involved. All right, so I assume he's talking about his head and the top of his body. (laughs) Um, (laughs) That was my drum roll. All right, my head getting involved. So a lot of guys, this happens to a lot of guys, they um, they get stuck in their head when they're having sex. And because they're stuck in their head, they either have experienced premature ejaculation or they, they can't come because they're just so much in their head and they're so worried and there's all this stress and anxiety coming to the surface instead of actually being in the moment and experiencing the moment, which is supposed to feel good, right? So when your head is getting involved, I would ask yourself, like, what's coming up? What's coming up in your head when you're supposed to be, not supposed to be, but in this place where you most likely would want to be relaxing and de-stressing and having fun and feeling good. What are the thoughts getting involved in your head to keep you from that feeling? Because when you can understand those thoughts and then you can talk them out at a later time, not with the partner right after sex, most likely is not the best time, um, (laughs) depending who you're with, right? But I would, I would ask yourself how you can just save that thought for later, you know, and then, and then address it. Don't ignore it. Don't get to the point where you have certain thoughts pop up every time you have sex and you never address them. You just avoid it or try to shake it off and just try to get through it. And then the same situation comes up next time. So try to understand. When we understand things about our thoughts, guys, we have more control over them. You know, so when you bring understanding to a thought and you know why it's there, you have this new, this newfound control over the thought instead of allowing it to control you. When you don't address it and you run from it and you avoid it, that's when it has control over you and it can use that control whenever it wants, most likely during times when you're in a vulnerable state, such as sex. All right, so understand what thoughts you have. Go to a coach, go to a therapist, or go to a really good friend and talk them out with them to get a new perspective around why you may be having these thoughts and what they're, why they're in your head, why you think they're in your head during sex. All right, number four, time for sex. So making time for sex is another big sex-related challenge. Now, when it comes, when it comes to time for sex, and I just started working with a couple um, but making time, you want to, you want to kind of create it. If you can have a mix of spontaneity and also planning. So there's nothing wrong with planning sex and putting it on the calendar. It's actually really, 
it actually could be really sexy, especially for women love those like anticipation moments of like, oh my God, we have sex planned for Friday. Like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to wear this outfit. I'm going to do this. I'm going to have this ready to go, you know, and it's for both people. It could be really an- exciting, the anticipation, the build up, right? And especially for women, this is important because when we experience the buildup, and I think I was talking about this in the last episode, actually, when it comes to foreplay, that anticipation and buildup for us is 90% of the sexual experience, you know? So making the time and planning it, don't feel like planning is weird. Planning is actually pretty awesome and very beneficial in terms of allowing her to build up her her uh, sexual anticipation and excitement, therefore getting horny and hornier, hornier and hornier, I don't know what word I just said, by the day in order to get to the point of feeling so turned on by the time it's sex. It's sexy time. So having a mix, trying to do your best of having a mix of, of the planned sex and then spontaneous sex is a great way to go about it and and prioritizing it, you know, because we make time for the things we prioritize. That's really, that's no bullshit there, right? If we prioritize something, we will do it. If it is a main priority for us, we will do it. We will find a way, we will get it done. If it's not a priority, we will say we don't have time, right? (laughs) So you have to ask yourself, is this truly a priority for me and my partner? And if it's not, how can I talk to them about this? All right. Number five, want to wait, want to wait for marriage. All right. So in terms of this being a big sex related challenge, it can definitely be difficult in today's society to hold off for sex when it, to hold off on sex for marriage because sex is all over the place, right? It kind of, it always has been, but even until this point, I think it's becoming less taboo. It's more out there. It's more in your face, which actually is a great thing. I think it should be um, because it's such a natural, it's the most natural part of life there is, right? I also kind of like that it's taboo because it makes it really like, it kind of makes it sexy to talk about. (laughs) It has like that mystery along with the taboo nature of it. But anyway, um, when it comes to waiting for marriage, it's it's of course difficult and I think it's just in in this situation making yourself putting yourself in a situation where temptations are on the lower side right you can be really easily tempted today sexually and if you can create strict boundaries then there's definitely possibility for less um less temptation, um, less resentment for yourself if you end up doing things you didn't want to do. Um, so it's just really, it's just really setting yourself up for success in this way and getting excited to meet the person of your dreams who you're going to share this sexual experience with. I think it's also important to still maintain a sexual relationship with you. And that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you have to you have to masturbate every day or whatever. Like there's no like set, here's how you have a healthy sexual relationship with yourself. But, but to have it, like what does a healthy sexual relationship with you mean to you? What is your perspective on that? And when it comes to a partner who you're going to eventually share that with, what does that look like in your eyes? And what are you excited for to share sexually with this person? You know, I think that would make the anticipation for this person so much more exciting and and also when you have replayed a certain experience that you see in your head it's just like having a past memory you know the brain thinks that already happened so whenever you're whenever you're thinking or dreaming up a scenario in which you are sharing experiences with a future partner it's like you're practicing so when it comes time for the actual experience you're not as nervous you're not as like confused or worried or anxious. Maybe you're not any of these things, but it just is a good way to set you up for confidence in this area of your life if you're not physically experiencing it right now. Um, This doesn't mean like have intentional, like wet dreams all the time. (laughs) Um, But, you know, I hope you know what I mean, where it's just like, get clear with what this relationship is going to look like for you. um, And then set boundaries around temp, around, uh, lack of temptation as far as what you can control. Number six, controlling a high sex drive when not having a romantic partner. 
All right. So I would ask you, you know, I would ask yourself, like, what is, what does it mean to control a high sex drive? Like, what does that mean to you? Because for me to control my high sex drive is different than how you would control yours. So I would ask yourself like, all right, well, when I am controlling my high sex drive, what does that actually mean? What am I doing? What am I saying? How am I feeling? How am I acting? Um, And having that ideal scenario for how you want to be in your sexual relationship with you when you do not have a partner to to share it with yet. So what does that look like for you? Get really clear on that because, like I said, it would be different for everybody. And if you can feel like you are in control because you have defined what that means to you, then you'll have a lot more confidence when it comes to your sex drive, right? So maybe that means, all right, no porn at all when I'm single, you know, just as an example. Um, You know, maybe it means only masturbating this amount of times per week so that I have the energy to go out and grow a social life where I can actually become involved with an actual person, you know? So those are just two examples of things you could take or leave um, just to help you understand that a little clearer. Number seven, lasting longer in a dominant position. All right. So when it comes to, when it comes to lasting longer, it's tough. Like this is actually a tough combo because Often in order to last longer, you want to steer away from dominant positions <laughs> because they are, uh, they do put you in the habit, the natural habit and tendency of thrusting very hard and fast because you're in control and you kind of, your body takes on this, um, you know, this, this masculine dominant um, control of just that, uh feeling, (laughs) which of course I don't feel, uh, because I don't thrust (laughs) as you guys do. Um, some women do thrust. That is not me. So when it comes to, when it comes to lasting longer, if you want to stay the majority of the time in a dominant position, then I would practice the practice edging, which is something you can do to when you're getting really close, just pull out and then either go towards her and start kissing her, um, start making out with her lips, start kissing her neck and just keep it, you know, you're, you're still keeping it sexy, but you're also not stopping the sexual experience. So that's, um, a good way to just kind of control it and also stay behind her. It doesn't mean you have to change positions. You can put it back in once you calm down a little bit, But that idea of edging is just to, when you get to the point where you feel like you're about to come, pull out, calm yourself down, and you essentially train your body to be more in control of your ejaculation. So you can keep those dominant positions, but practice edging with it, and that could help you to last longer overall. Otherwise, changing up positions is a good way to to last longer overall, because, you know, especially, especially doggy, it's really hard for guys to, to, to maintain that position and that level of thrusting and dominance and quickness, you know, like you're, you're just very likely to come much, probably much sooner than you would like to. But, but yeah, I would try for this. There, there are many ways you can last longer, but for now, I'm just going to say, switch, like pull out, calm yourself down, practice edging, and then you can go back to your dominant position. All right. Number eight, receiving a blowjob. So this is another big sex related challenge, receiving a blowjob. I think a lot of guys, what a lot of guys, and this is just one perspective, obviously I'll be talking a lot about blowjobs in the future, (laughs) but, um, I have to stop laughing at like every sexual word, <laughs> like the worst sex coach ever. No, I'm just kidding. Um, not really. All right. Receiving a blowjob. So what a lot of guys fail to realize or understand is that if you can make your woman feel really sexy when she's giving you a blowjob, you're, you essentially start to win her over. And I think guys forget this or they don't take full advantage of this because because when you're enjoying that experience, 
and you do something that she really likes, you know, while you're enjoying that experience, whether it's calling her a certain name, whether it's like looking at her a certain way or like playing with her hair a certain way, whether you're squeezing it or just like, like grabbing her head gently, you know, like, and, and talking to her a certain way. Like there are are a lot of things you can do to make the experience enjoyable for her so that she wants to give you more blowjobs, you know? And, and I think this is just like so underrated and guys don't realize that women can really enjoy it if they're treated a certain way while they do it. Don't be the guy that just lays back and like closes his eyes and isn't involved with her. Like she's just going to feel like her jaw is strained, like it's not worth it, like it's not fun It's not like she can't get turned on because she doesn't feel like you're into it or she's not sure if you're into it. So there's like a little, you know, annoyance or anxiety there. So you have to think about the feelings you're, you're, um, you're bringing into the experience of a blowjob. How are you making her feel when she's making you feel this way? You know, I think this is how we should be for each other about partners. This is like a sexual experience is about trying to gauge how we can both have pleasure while we pleasure each other. So if you can find ways to have her, to make the process enjoyable for her as it is for you, then you know she's most likely to reciprocate that when you're pleasuring her. And it's just a much better experience. So like I said, I'll touch more on that topic in the future, but I'm going to move on to number nine. Number nine, the biggest sexual experience, uh, sexual challenges <laughs> is lasting more than 15 minutes when I have my girl and doggy. Wow. That's actually a long time. 15 minutes. <laughs> like, um, that is a long time to last while in doggy guys, actually the, this may shock you, but like the, the average sexual experience, like the average amount. Yeah. The average time it takes to have a sexual experience and to end that experience is between five and six minutes, which is pretty crazy, right? But it doesn't have to be like this long thing. What should be the long thing is the foreplay leading up to it, right? And then if you want to have a lengthy sexual session, then by all means, you know, take a, take a boner pill and go for an hour. But it's, you know, it's not, um, it's not always, you know, the average is, is very much less than you think. When it comes to, and I'm just going to throw in this number too, when it comes to premature ejaculation, if you come in under less than a minute, that is a sign that you possibly are experiencing premature ejaculation. So so yeah, when it comes to lasting more than 15 minutes, when you have your girl and doggy, which, um, which is a dominant, you're in a dominant position, right? So So when you're in that dominant position, I would just go back to, the edging technique, right? What can you do if you want to stay in that dominant position? What can you do to sort of pull back and calm your body down and do something that, that calms you? You know, maybe it's just like rubbing her back really quick. Maybe it's like flipping her over and dirty talking and, you know, grabbing her wrists and saying something and like kissing her neck for a few minutes. And then you get back up, flip her back over and keep going. So that's like, that's a way for you to calm yourself down and, hold that position, uh, keep that position in the mix. But, but yeah, if you're just, if you're just going, going and going 15 minutes or more, um, yeah, you're going to have to at some point train yourself how to, how to go longer than 15 minutes. It's about training. So I think edging is probably the, one of the best techniques you can use, um, in order to train your body to do that. All right. Also along with edging, is pelvic floor exercises. So if you guys are familiar familiar with Kegels, where you're, you're pretty much holding in as if you were to hold in your pee, if you were to hold and squeeze in as if you're holding in your pee for three seconds, and then let go for three seconds, squeeze in for three seconds, release for three seconds, and you do that. I read today in an article, I forgot what article it was, I apologize, but, um, but it was saying to do it 10 reps, three times a day of that three second hold, three second release. And that's a great way to, to control your ejaculation as well. All right. Number 10, lasting long enough. All right. So this is pretty much lasting. All right. I'm, I'm going, uh, I'm going to do a post actually on Instagram about 
lasting longer today. So we'll skip that one because I already talked on that a little bit. Number 11, keeping the flame burning and wanting to have sex at the same time. All right, so keeping the flame burning and wanting to have sex at the same time. I would ask yourself, how often are you, what does it mean to keep the flame burning? What does that mean for you? Um, For you and for you and your partnership. And what did it look like when you were both wanting to have sex at the same time? Was there ever a time when you were both just ready for it? A time in your life? And what was different at that time in your life? And you may straight away go to, oh, we didn't have kids. Like, we didn't have so many responsibilities. And now we have to take care of my mom and like blah, blah, blah. And things may have really changed. But I want you to really challenge yourself to not get tied up and like, oh, it's just too different because now we all have all these responsibilities and it's crazy. We'll never go back to like blah, blah, blah. I want you to really think about, all right, what is possible at this point in order for us to keep that flame burning based on what kept it burning in the past? Like, sure, things are very different now, but were there little things that we were doing back then that we don't do anymore? You know, did I, did I flirt with her throughout the day and I don't really do that anymore? You know, did I smile at her a certain way? Did I buy her a certain thing from the food store and I just stopped buying it? Like, you know, were there things that that I used to do or say and things that she used to do and say that we just don't do anymore and that that might be blowing out the flame? Or, you know, your question is keeping the flame burning. So there must be something where the flame the flame is at least lit it sounds like keeping the flame burning and wanting to have sex at the same time what is going on to keep the flame burning right now what is it and how can you amplify that or those things those actions or those behaviors and how can you maybe add something new you know for instance for example a great way um something when i'm having my couple do the couple I'm working with is to prioritize quality time together where they're playing a certain question game and they sit on the couch and they spend at least 20 minutes and they tell each other, Hey, you know, I got 20 minutes. Let's go on the couch and let's, let's play the game. And it's this deep dive of questions that are very intimate questions. And it's just both partners know that they want to improve their intimacy in their relationship and they want to spend more quality time and they want to have more laughter and they want to have more deep conversations. So this is a really good way to initiate, hey, we both said we wanted this. Like, let's go do it. Like, we got 20 minutes. Let's prioritize it. It's just 20 minutes. And that's what's really good too is putting a time frame on it because then neither of the person feels like they're trapped for an hour or like not overwhelmed with all the stuff they have to get done. They know there's a boundary and they could get out after 20 minutes, you know, so that's always helpful. But to just this one example of playing this question game and both holding to it is a way to deepen the relationship and create more more curiosity about each other. You know, when you're sharing things you're not used to sharing about each other, it's kind of like this newness comes into the mix where you're laughing about new things and you're you're sharing new things and you're curious about certain things because you just learned something new about someone you've been with for 20 years. You know, it's like... So just doing, that's a great way to keep the flame burning. And also being ready, having experiences like that on the daily, little tiny experiences like that, the flirting, the way you look at your partner, the way you, the way you laugh with them, the way you just grab their hand and squeeze it as you walk by or grab, grab their butt and walk by, you know, those little things really add up. And that is going to prepare both people to being ready more likely at the same time. Eventually. All right, let's go to number 12. Sex related challenge, go out and touch each other sexually, but secretly in public. (laughs) Okay, so if this is a challenge, um, I'm not sure if this is a challenge because your partner doesn't want to do this. Um, So this could be a little tricky Um, or if it's a challenge because you just don't know how to initiate this to the point where it can be publicly uh, safe or appropriate. (laughs) Um, So I always thought a really sexy idea if the two of you are into this would be to have her either wear... um, (laughs) 
<laughs> Guys, this is so funny because I'm not used to talking about like such R-rated stuff. <laughs> like, I'm like in my head like, wait, is this appropriate before I say it? But um, if I want to move into the sex topic, it's it's time to overcome this. So, you know, I think a really secretive sexy idea is for her to actually wear like have a toy inside of her or outside of her her panties while she goes out with you or maybe not wear any panties and it's like your little secret together um having you know planning sex in a place where you know it's very dark but somewhat publicly just do not get caught (laughs) um and and just being on board with what you guys are that you're both okay with it you know and that you're both into it um I think like initiating it in a way that's very dominant and certain is the best way to make your partner feel comfortable. Because if you're like, eh, should we do this? I don't know. I'm kind of nervous. It's less likely to happen. So, so kind of like giving each other the green light to like, and, and being very certain that this is something you want to do and you have an idea of how you want to do it. And then just go in with the idea and see how your partner reacts just try to be really confident about it and then and then have a good time see what happens all right 13 the fear that that the amazing okay last sex related challenge the fear that the amazing momentum slash chemistry we have will eventually fade all right this is a great one um this is a great one because it's very real right but i think that um yeah, I think it's it's having the it's having the realist attitude that yeah, it it will fade, but then it can get stronger again. You know, it's just like it's just like in life with everything. Life is a roller coaster, right? There are always ups and downs. It is never always on the up and up. And for you to feel like like sex or your relationship will be the same is just setting yourself up for failure. So it's it's recognizing that yeah, things aren't always going to be happy and exciting and sexy, but I'm prepared for when it's not. Like, I know I know how to handle it, and I know that everything's going to be, you know, I know that I'm with a partner who's going to, who prioritizes me, and we're going to do our best to get through it. And um, if anything, I'm going to do my best to get through it. So really just putting the trust back on yourself and understanding that, yeah, it's a reality and that's, so, that's okay, but that's what makes the highs so good, right? Because if we never experienced lows or uncertainties, we wouldn't appreciate the highs so much. And I think it's, it's good to be real about that, but I think it's also good to not live in that fear of not being able to presently enjoy the great momentum in chemistry. Because you're not presently enjoying that if you're living in fear. You can't do both at the same time. Right. So I would try to focus more on couples who you admire in terms of like, wow, they just seem to like really have it together. You know, who do you know in your life that just handles things like takes things as they come, but like deals with it and like does it with love and like is there for each other. And no matter how hard it is, like they keep going and then and then they do have like this really sexy, attractive side to them. Because they come out of the hardships and they do it together. Unfortunately, I don't think many of us know a lot of those types of couples. Um, and I was just I was just watching a video actually of Esther Perel, and she was saying, you know, it's it's kind of sad because we have we have so many. It's so easy for us to name our favorite brand, our favorite band, right, or like our favorite musician, or our favorite actor, and we have like these role models in different areas of our lives, like business, right? Like everybody's obsessed with business today. And when it comes to relationships, there's not many people to emulate and kind of look up to in that sense. So it's important to find who's around your life to kind of give you that, that uplifting hope and that proof that, Hey, this is possible. If it's possible for them, it's possible for me and my partner. Um, so just looking at that more than you do the fear of the potential loss that you didn't even even experience yet, you know, so, and hopefully you don't. So it's that way you can be more in the moment of these amazing good times of momentum and chemistry, but, but be a realist, understand it's not always going to be here and the, the lows make the highs so much better. And it's just, just do the best you can, right. And focus on that, that couple who you're emulating. 
All right, guys, so that is it. Those are the 13. I didn't want to go crazy into them all, but I hope that me just going through these gives you another perspective. Um, I'm sure there are many perspectives on these. You know, I even have more perspectives on each of these. So there's not like one answer fits all type thing. It's just, okay, how can I expand a little bit on this challenge? And how can I help myself by getting more perspectives from other people? So that is it. If you have not yet, please um, leave a rating and review for this podcast. And also submit any requests you have for future sex-related topics. Because I think you will, um, well, like I said, you will be hearing more sex-related topics. And if you want to dive into specific ones. I'm going to be covering more specific ones. So submit any requests. All you got to do is leave a rating and review and then head over to Instagram at Steph Ganowski and let me know what you want the next episode to be with a screenshot of your review. All right, that is it. Have an amazing morning, evening, or night wherever you are in the world, and I'll talk to you soon. 